Okay, we'll make a start. I think uh, the amount of people joining this is, is still, still increasing, um, but I'll do an introduction, hopefully by then um, everyone would have joined us. So, hello everyone, thank you for joining us on this Thursday afternoon. Um, it's, it's great to have so many of you joining us for this presentation. Um, just a bit of housekeeping before we get started. Um, so this webinar will be recorded. Um, so if you have any issues um, with that, um, at the second we can't see you on any cameras so so hopefully that won't be a problem but um if at any point you do speak or so forth and and um, just have that in your mind um that this presentation will be going online for people to view at a later date um if throughout this presentation uh, you have any questions please use the q a function at the bottom of the zoom screen um i'll manage these and i'll present these to uh, richard at the end of the presentation um, it just provides us a bit of order uh, when it comes to asking the questions and it means I can um, manage and, and take out any repeat questions on your behalf. Um, so yeah, uh, firstly, thank you, uh, Simon and Barbara for helping us set this up. Uh, much appreciated. Um, and then uh, thank you to uh, Richard Charman from the Environment Agency for agreeing to give us this presentation today. Um, I've seen this presentation before. I found it really interesting and really useful. I know many of us have as well, uh, and I thought it'd be a really good opportunity to share it with uh, the wider SIOM audience. So, um, yeah, um, normally we do health and safety and at the beginning of this sort of thing. Um, so uh, I'd like to just briefly touch on ensuring you have a safe setup, a safe um, you know, working setup. So um, if you are stressed and strange in your working environment, I think it's a good thing to, to consider. Um, and I, I think we'll keep it light. I think we'll leave it there. Um, so yeah, without uh, me talking too much further, I'll, I'll introduce Richard, um, here to give the presentation on estuary edges, and placing man-made barriers with a variety of habitat, uh, with a variety of habitats. Um, here, the picture on this opening slide may be different to the one on, on the front of your slide, Richard, but I'll, I'll let you explain that briefly when, when you start. So uh, yeah, Richard, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Stuart. Um, so as Stuart alluded to, this is the second time I've given this presentation. Um, right, so I now need to change this uh, to my presentation, but before I do that, I'll just point out that the image on the, uh, the right hand side uh, is the Greenwich Peninsula in London, uh, the Millennium Dome, uh, which has uh, estuary edge enhancements uh, along it. Uh, and I, when I switch to my presentation in a moment, that will have uh, a view a, a closer up view of the same of the same um, edges. So how do I do this now? I think I need to be host. Um, Barbara, host. if you stop sharing, then uh, he can share from there. Okay. Uh, this is, you cannot start sharing screen while the other participant is sharing. Um, Barbara, we just need you to stop sharing the um, the intro slide. Ah, that's it. Right. Hopefully, everyone can see that presentation slide. Wonderful. That's good. Um, so it's a very slight tweak in the title, um, I think because it didn't actually fit into the SciWem funky template for their website. Um, so I think Barbara replaced uh, replacing brick, concrete and metal tidal walls with barriers. Um, but effectively the original title, uh, which is also our slogan on, our, um, on the Estuary Edges website, is replacing brick, concrete and metal tidal walls with a variety of habitats. Um, I presented about a month, maybe a month and a half ago to internal environment agency staff uh, and this presentation got a lot of questions and a lot of um, uptake, which was fantastic. It was near the beginning of lockdown at that point. I think people were looking for structure in their diaries, so it actually may have got more uh, uptake as a result of that. Um, so what you see in the, uh, the photograph is the O2, the Greenwich Peninsula in London, and the um, enhancements that were created as a result of the construction of the Millennium Dome. Uh, it was a, a highly contaminated site uh, with old sheet steel piles along the front of most of the uh, edge. And in the design, a, 
uh, a new wall uh, was created further back and then terraces uh, created with a mixture of uh, gabions, um, a mixture of um, L-shaped concrete walls uh, were created at varying elevations uh, with varying pockets. The one you're seeing is the longest pocket, which we refer to as the northeastern section of it. Um, and you'll see the sheet steel piles at the front, the old ones, the, the original uh, failing ones in some cases, were truncated and capped with new timber. Um, and in many places, that actually allows a transition from the mudflat up into the uh, pseudo salt marsh, uh, as, I, as I'd like, I like to call it. Um, we know that in many of our estuaries around the uh, world, reclamation and um, claiming of um, former salt marsh or former estuary style uh, habitats has, has meant has impoverished those habitats and we've, we've lost a lot of um, our ecology. So the aim with estuary edges is to encourage developers to, to set back and give a little bit of that land back to the estuary, primarily with vegetated uh, salt marsh style plants. And we know through past and uh, present monitoring and hopefully with future monitoring, which estuary edges um, will continue to do uh, some monitoring or continues to push for monitoring, um, that there's an impact on plants, invertebrates, fish and birds, um, as well as the, the more accessible ability for greener spaces and uh, positive impacts on mental health, uh, which I think we all agree at this, this time, this strange time we're all stuck at home, it's, it's very important to get out and get our daily exercise and see these green spaces. Um, so we launched a new website in July 2019 uh, which uh, replaced some earlier PDFs that were um, written in 2008. And the new website, which I will go through uh, parts of in this presentation, is basically a how-to guide on um, ecological design for softening the edges of estuaries to encourage, encourage wildlife into them. Um, and, all, and I must stress, that although the Thames Estuary is used as the case study uh, for that, the principles should be able to be applied to any urban, muddy, temperate estuary. So um, I'm not talking about the tropics where you'd have mangroves and the fact that it's muddy would typically imply that it's macrotidal. Uh, so you, you have a, a large tidal range and this is about trying to get uh, vegetation into um, muddy habitats. So hopefully, good, the slide transition, that's great. So our case study estuary, the tidal Thames. Um, it's 113 kilometres of tidal river uh, from the Isle of Sheppey, where there was a major cliff fall yesterday, uh, or uh, two days ago actually, uh, to uh, Teddington, where your blue line finishes to the west. It's uh, about 113 kilometres. Um, and much of the banks of that entire stretch are hardened and modified, approximately 60%. Um, and within the central stretch, the London stretch, so the western part of what you're looking at, um, we estimate there's only about 1% natural banks. That's just 420 metres, uh, and that's at Scion Park for anyone who, uh, who knows the location. Why is it so important that um, this has a fringing habitat? Well, it acts, an estuary, any estuary, uh, acts as a wildlife superhighway, um, and in this case, it's, it's through the centre of a densely populated city, um, supporting varying habitats, mudflats, uh, salt marsh, reed beds, which are all priority habitats in, in the UK. And that dynamic environment with changing tides, the mix of the freshwater and the saline conditions, um, acts as a nursery and a spawning area for many species of fish, such as smelt, which is also a priority species. Um, in the Thames itself, we've got 125 different species of fish and many rare and scarce species, including the German hairy snail and the tulip door snail. I can never do that without checking uh, notes. So, um, and at the bottom, you'll see an aerial photograph uh, of that. Um, the black lines you see drawn on the map denominate how the tidal Thames is broken up under the Water Framework Directive into three different water bodies, the Upper Thames, Middle Thames and the Lower Thames. Uh, so there's one black line at Richmond and another black line at uh, Basildon, Tilbury area. So 
So that leads us into the Water Framework Directive, which is one of the reasons for estuary edges. Um, and, and the way the Water Framework Directive is set up, it will classify um, water bodies, uh, which we know we've got three of in the title terms, as either natural or uh, artificial. Uh, and then uh, when you know they've been modified for a reason, it lists those reasons. So the tidal Thames is heavily, heavily modified for flood protection, uh, Thames barrier in the top left, and for navigation, um, vessels at Dubai ports shown in the bottom right. And, and, that, and that means that within, we are unable to change those reasons for modification. So the tidal Thames will still have to have flood protection and uh, navigation on it and the enhancements that we're looking for the biodiversity enhancements therefore have to fit within those um, modifications lost salt marsh i think i hinted at this on my introductory slide um, since 1860 uh, the environment agency has calculated that 10,000 hectares of salt marsh has been lost since uh, 1860 um, and if you look at the, uh, the map on the screen and you can see all of the blue areas, which extends out into the Medway estuary to the east as well um, as up through central London. Most of that blue area, if you exclude the actual um, central watercourse itself, would have been reed bed, salt marsh, mudflat in some form or another. Um, and then you add on the pressure of sea level rise onto that, uh, which is already eroding the fringe of existing salt marsh uh, in many places, but I'm pleased to report not everywhere. Um, and uh, you're seeing in the top right hand corner uh, some new salt marsh actually that's accreted to the, to the right of the photograph, but then much of the old historical salt marsh uh, where the cliffing and the sections of mud are breaking off uh, and rolling across the mud flats. That's, that's the erosion. And that cliffing is quite typical of many of our salt marshes now. Um, courtesy, that photograph is courtesy of Mark Davison, so thank you, Mark. Um, if you add on a growing city on top of the reclamation and the sea level rise and the loss, you have rather a sorry, uh, a sorry story. So what are we looking at with, a grow with any growing city? Um, Shading by bridges, shading by new tower blocks, uh, lighting under bridges, lighting for navigation, uh, extending the land into the river, um, which we call encroachment. We believe the Thames is about a third of its original size in terms of the, uh, the, 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 the wet uh, central channel. Um, and dredging, which results in faster currents, uh, deeper channels, uh, with sharper hard edges, uh, metal walls, concrete walls, brick walls, um, and therefore a lack of the gentle slopes that you would have had on mud, from mud flats to salt marshes and then up into the terrestrial zone that you would have had before. So this results in a more hostile environment for life to cling on to um, and further impacts on uh, water quality, uh, loss of brownfield habitat and um, loss of, of green open space next to the river. However, enough of the sob story. So this is where the sob story ends and we start to talk about the positives. Um, there are three different classifications that we've worked out in uh, estuary edges. Yeah, there may be different ways of classifying it, but that's how uh, it was classified on the, it's classified on the latest website. Um, managed realignment in its smallest form, um, maybe just a single creek uh, or a, um, a, a, a concrete wall which has been set back by seven or eight meters uh, we're referring to as naturalized setback um, so the pictures you're seeing here tend to be to the east of London um, the uh, Barking Creek barrier that you see in the top right hand corner with the little creek that is created just to the just um, upstream of that in that in that park area um, that is one of our uh, best examples and the, um, the, the uh, photograph beneath that in the bottom right of your screen shows um, sampling that was done uh, in, in that site uh, maybe in about 2006. 
um, and the blue box that you're seeing with the fish in it, they were the fish that were caught in that net. Um, a less um, extensive example is in the bottom left, also in the same section of the river, which is the river of Roding, uh, which is Barking Creek, it's the same place, uh, different name just to confuse people, um, where you can see the fronting concrete wall was chopped down and then uh, brushwood uh, fascines were used to help accretion of, of sediment with a new flood defence set uh, further back, uh, which is a clay earth embankment. So that's naturalised setback. Now, that has the, the greatest benefits for ecology um, and, and our sampling uh, as a result of this project shows that and some sampling showed that before. Um, however, that doesn't mean that if there is no space for that, that we should give up. So that's when it brings us to um, intertidal vegetated terraces, which are a more compact version of that and include more engineering. And that may include um, sheet steel piles, it may include uh, timber. Um, and so the, the different examples you're seeing on the screen, um, so some of them are, are in the upper estuary, so Wandsworth, uh, which is in the um, maybe more freshwater environment is in the top left of your screen. And the um, top right of your screen is the Greenwich terraces again, the ones that were on the front uh, slide. Um, and by accident, actually, that top right hand one ended up becoming a terrace that because of the gravel that had built up on one end, there's actually a continuum uh, from one terrace to another with no edges. And that we found enables bottom dwelling fish such as um, goby and flounder to transcend up from one terrace to another and that we found on the ones where there are edges and sharp edges and there's no link, no constant um, link, those fish don't like doing that. They don't like to get risk being isolated. Um, so what we've learnt with these designs over the last 10, 20 years, um, vertical edges are obviously a deterrent uh, for fish. Um, it's good to have vegetation cover because we're trying to create a uh, lost salt marsh. Um, low gradient is good but not horizontal. Salt marsh wouldn't be horizontal and it doesn't drain very well so you end up with waterlogging. Um, it's good to have multiple elevations not just one elevation so that you get the maximum diversity of different species. Um, and also importantly, the Greenwich example in the bottom left, um, a cost benefit uh, calculation has shown that actually it's cheaper to put in the gabions and the smaller backing concrete wall in places than it is to completely replace the sheet steel piles at the front. So there is a, 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 a financial benefit for doing this that's not just ecosystem services based. wall options. So this is what happens when you have no space to set back at all but there's still the ability to bolt on timbers and rebuild a wall uh, so that it's got niches for wildlife and I think the best example of that is the bottom um, the bottom central photograph showing timbers which have been bolted on in Deptford Creek which is near Greenwich in London um, and the amount of vegetation which has taken hold on those timbers uh, versus the wall to the right, an identical section of wall with nothing on it. Um, all of the examples you're seeing on the screen are in the same creek. It's had a lot of work done to it. Um, so the top right photograph shows sections of timbers which have had um, gravel put into them, almost like window boxes. Um, and then strips along the bottom to help encourage sediment to accrete as well, the plastic, the plastic strips. Um, the top uh, left photograph uh, is, is a wall that's com been completely clad uh, in timbers. Now that, debatably, that is a problem for inspection of sheet steel piles. And so that wouldn't be done like that now. That would have greater gaps and greater coverage. And we are working on um, a document to work out what needs to be permanently revealed and what can be um, temporarily covered to allow inspections of uh, the sheet steel piles. Um, 
not notable also and not particularly visible because it blends in with the building above is the sand um the sand section of habitat that's immediately above the timber cladding um, and so this was someone's inspirational idea to include uh, nesting holes for maybe um, sand martins, kingfishers. I think it's mainly occupied by bees actually. There's, there's visible bee holes um, in there, bee burrows in there. Um, so even in scenarios where a developer cannot give any space back to the estuary, it's possible to maybe rebuild the wall or reclad it to get some value for wildlife. However, it would be less valuable than the naturalised setback. So there were some 2008 PDFs, um, which I, I'm still meaning to contact everyone who I find um, on their websites to say, please redirect their websites to the new, um, the new Estuary Edges uh, website. Um, and many of the designs that are on the current website, the, the new website, were already written up in the 2008 document. Um, but it was well, relatively weak, that document for influencing developers. Um, and it wasn't particularly interactive. So um, it was Joe Heiss, who's a biodiversity technical specialist uh, in uh, my team at the Environment Agency, although she's currently on an assignment, uh, who came up with the idea of working with the Thames Estuary Partnership to um, refresh and update uh, because we knew some sites hadn't worked very well. Some sites uh, had been waterlogged, had been shaded, uh, the sediment washed out. Um, there wasn't the observed number of fish that we thought there would be. Um, some designs had failed, such as a gabion um, had, had torn open and the, and the rocks had fallen out. Uh, geotextile had been washed free. Um, so there was a lot of information, oh, including litter as well, um, that we knew about uh, these that we wanted to update and, in, and include. Um, so we launched into the, into the project, uh, working with um, the Thames Estuary Partnership, as well as the Port of London Authority, who very nicely um, host the, the website and pay for the website uh, to, to be updated. Um, we included more quantification than in the 2008 documents. So there was more ecological surveys on plants, invertebrates uh, and fish, um, both on and off the terraces at 11 sites. Um, and and we, we needed to update the website really also to help with various large infrastructure projects, such as the Tideway Tunnel, the, the super sewer, um, and our own internal at the Environment Agency, um, Thames Estuary Asset Management Project, Team 2100 as it's called, uh, which is managing the future of the flood defences in the Thames Estuary. So there were 11 sites that were measured ecologically, but actually there's 17 sites in Estuary's in Estridge's website. So uh, we couldn't afford to measure all of them. Um, and they vary uh, all the way from the upper estuary uh, at Wandsworth, uh, which is shown in the bottom left of your screen, down to um, the, the furthest outer estuary one is at Royal Wharf, which is just in, inside the Thames barrier. Um, and then there are tidal tributaries, including um, Barking Creek, which is the top right hand corner photographs, the four photographs you see there, down to Dartford Creek, which is in the bottom right hand corner of, um, of the map. Uh, there's, and so there's, you've got a mixture of tidal tributaries, a mixture of more freshwater influenced, more saline. Um, so, and, and, and um, you add all those permutations together and it comes to about 17, 17 sites. Um, so we've tried to cover through careful placing of the sites uh, to get information that would, that would be available to any developer on any section of an estuary. So in terms of surveys, um, there was fish at 11 sites on and off terraces where possible. Invertebrates um, were measured at nine key sites. Plants were measured at nine key sites. The geomorphology was measured at, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm a geomorphologist by profession. 
um, that that involved going to each site and working out where we felt uh, sediment had accreted and where it had eroded. Um, engineering that was kindly provided by um, Team 2100 uh, in the form of uh, Marcus Phillips, who's an engineer. Uh, litter that was conducted by uh, me. Um, navigational safety that was provided by the Port of London Authority and social surveys which were provided by the Thames Estuary Partnership, where they did questionnaires with members of the public um, at some of the sites to find out what they felt um, uh, about the, the greenery and the enhancements and what their understanding was of the estuary. And uh, the photographs you're seeing show uh, same netting, which is the top right hand uh, photograph, a fike net, which is the bottom left hand photograph. And the right hand photograph is the plastic litter, um, many microplastics, which we're standing on at uh, Wandsworth, which is the most upstream of, of the sites, rather sadly. So I promised in this presentation, I'd do a little bit more on the sample results. So this is the, the one that's akin to my heart the most, that I did the surveys my, myself. Um, and it involved, there was nothing complicated about this, but there was no uh, buried datum where we worked out how much accretion had happened. It was by eye um, as, as to where we could see signs of sediment accretion and where we could see signs of sediment erosion. And um, this is four of the 17 sites that, that were measured. Um, roughly, uh, they're going from uh, upper estuary on the left-hand side to um, central estuary on the right-hand side of the screen. Uh, and these are all terrace designs, so they're all vegetated into tidal terraces of, of, the, of the categories that we've looked at. Um, Battersea, you can see in the red text, only 33% accreted. Um, and we believe that's because the site is too um, steep. We've, we've found out over, over the years that if it's too steep and there's wave energy, then it's very unlikely to accrete, or if it accretes at the beginning, it will be likely to wash out. Um, Greenwich has performed pretty well, but not maybe as well as we hope, because there's a fair amount of wave energy from vessels. Um, Deptford Creek uh, is a very sheltered tributary, and hence 85% um, uh, there is accreted. The, the main areas for erosion of the drain is the drainage around the back of the uh, metal um, H um, bars that you see with the timber in between uh, in, that, in that bottom right photograph. Um, and the best accreted one, which is a very high level terrace um, within the tidal range, 97% uh, accreted at West India Dock, uh, which is to the eastern side of the Isle of Dogs for anyone who has local geographical knowledge. Value to fish at the created habitats. So you'll find that, of course, where it might be valuable for one measured element, it won't necessarily be valuable for, for all the others. Um, so here we're looking at um, Battersea is poor, and we believe, um, and that's that's the mixture of through fish sampling, but also through expert uh, judgment from our um, colleague Steve Colclough. Um, where there's a fair amount of eroded sediment uh, because of the steepness in combination with a boom that's supposed to prevent um, litter washing into the site that you can see in the uh, plastic boom that's, that's sitting um, in front of the site. Um, at that site three European eels were found, one bass, one common goby and two roach for anyone who has any knowledge of fish. Uh, unfortunately it doesn't mean uh, vast amounts to me. Um, the Greenwich Peninsula, uh, we felt, was um, good for fish. Uh, bass, common goby, thin-lipped grey mullet, flounder, eel, sand smelt and sand goby were all found at those. Um, and importantly, there's no edge. There's, there's a continuum between the uh, fronting foreshore, the gravel and mud flat, up onto the um, pseudo salt marsh there. So um, that's why that is so valuable. Um, Deptford Creek, uh, a ba one bass and one goby were found in the, in the sample. Um, it has sharp edges, as you can see. Uh, it's inundated regularly, which is good. So uh, we would suggest that it's inundated regularly, but there's no vegetation on that terrace because it's at too low a level and it's very heavily shaded. Um, West India Dock in the top right, um, again, a very sharp edge. 
It's a very high elevation, so it's not inundated very often by the tide. And there was only one, um, one species found there, and that was a European eel. So even though it's accreted really well, 97% for accretion, it doesn't appear to show the number of fish. Now, none of these, um, none of, none of, very little of this information is massively displayed on the estuaries website because we were only able to afford to do sampling once. So if you, clearly that's one dot on a graph, it doesn't show you any trends. Um, and so we need more sampling really to prove this. And there's a legacy with estuary edges that is gonna give, give sampling to citizen scientists and also to universities to, to continue the ability to get further data on this. So after we'd got the survey data and uh, we'd got lots of people um, on the project panel who were experts, um, we then contacted lots of other experts who have estuarine knowledge and we effectively locked them in a room for a day and we presented the ecological results and we presented some some hints of ideas that we thought would be wise to put on the website as what we what we're calling design principles um, and we asked those experts to come up with design principles that we would like developers to follow like a tick list a tick list to how to come up with a good estuary edge feature um, and incidentally, there's 17 design principles and there's 17 case studies. That's just a coincidence, but I've always liked the fact they match. Um, so these were some of the ideas they came up with. Um, they said, uh, approach multidisciplinary consultants to achieve a good product. Uh, use hardwood for structural elements because the softwood tends to deteriorate too, too uh, rapidly. And then you start off with a, um, maybe a terrace which is falling apart. Um, don't pre-plant unless absolutely necessary. Um, so getting a natural succession of a natural seed stock uh, into the site will also mean you'll end up with plants that will live and won't die off and be superseded by other plants. Um, guidance on plant species. So if planting must happen, which many developers need want, want the site to look amazing straight away, um, so although we've advised against planting, if it has to happen, then guidance on plant species used from different parts of an estuary. Um, zero tolerance for encroachments and no um, moving forwards uh, into the estuary and narrowing it any further. Uh, adaptability for climate change. Uh, so what happens with uh, sea level rise and increased storminess, maybe increased currents as a result of a larger um, tidal flow going in and out of the estuary. Uh, don't use plastic. Um, Make sure geomorphology is a priority. Uh, it's close to my heart again. Uh, so that gives you an idea of some of those uh, that were listed. And that was narrowed down into the 17 high level design principles. There is further detail behind the design principles with links that you can click to find out more information on, on, on use of timber. So the softwood hardwood debate. Um, there is individual um, guidelines for how to design a uh, a wall option versus a, a naturalized setback versus a vegetated, uh, vegetated intertidal terrace. Um, so that that displays maybe that so that what you're seeing on screen. I know it's very poor quality to be able to read the text, but that that shows maybe the main part of the of the website. And and you can also see on the drawing there where it says ecological value. Uh, we've got cross sections that roughly show the style of um, naturalized setback going through to wall options with encroachment having a negative impact. So design principle two, funny enough, design principle one is don't encroach. Uh, design principle two, so I'm just going to give you a, uh, a few design principles. Uh, but please do go away and have a look at the website and have a look at uh, the full list of design principles. Um, design principle two was always choose the design with the best ecological valuable practical within the site's limitations. So that's pushing the, the developer ideally to go with naturalized setback if they possibly can um, and, and avoid encroachment. So there is that uh, drawing I was talking about again in, in, with the cross sections. Something we have also noticed working with developers is that master planning 
uh, gets forgotten. And the master planning, where you're setting up your whole site layout and putting in freshwater drainage um, and road layouts and building positions, uh, means that shading can happen of um, some of these terraces. Um, ideally, a, a great setup and a uh, the most natural setup would be to have a freshwater creek or a sustainable urban drainage system type swale uh, going through an outfall into a salt marsh area because that would be the most similar to reality. Um, so we don't actually have very many examples of those, but we are still pushing pushing for them. Um, and this shows Royal Wharf, which is a new development on the um, left bank of the Tidal Thames, just inside of the Thames Barrier uh, at Silvertown, where um, there is such an example of a swale, which then leads to a, uh, a terrace, a salt marsh style terrace out, outside that. Uh, and you'll also see that the, the landscape designers have put in their, um, or the, the, the developers have put in their uh, sales suite uh, looking over that area so the, the value to the development of these enhancements is also very important. Uh, design principle six we wanted to make sure that um, history and the local area is reflected in any designs so we have pushed for um, having uh, we've, we've suggested that it's useful to have um, display signs, interpretation boards, that also helps with the social uh, side of things, or art such as the Anthony Gormley uh, structure, which is outside the Grapes public house uh, on the Isle of Dogs. Um, and then in the bottom left, which is right in the upper estuary, um, we've got um, a wall that was rebuilt near Kew. I forget the name of the location now, and apologies, it's not in my notes. Um, where niches were left, the, the, the brick wall was rebuilt and niches were left in that brick wall to encourage vegetation to, to re-establish very quickly. Design principle 10, I had to do this one because it's geomorphology. Um, considering currents and wave action, um, and we know that uh, in a, a navigational working estuary that that is a challenge we've learned a lot over the last 10 years about uh, where wave energy will be focused um, so the drawing um, on the screen and also the photographs below uh, show what can happen if you don't design it well so the bottom right photograph shows uh, a series of three terraces this is this is actually at the site which became the um, accidentally became the one where fish are able to transcend from one to the other because at the opposite end of that photograph uh, near that that boat um, is the gravel that has transcended across all the terraces. The bottom terrace sadly at least at that end of the site has completely washed out the sediment that was in there has gone um, and you can see remnants of the blue geotextile left behind. Um, this is also the site where gabium uh, baskets have failed so sorry I'm going back onto the sob story but still Although that is photographed at the extreme end, showing uh, what has gone wrong for that short section, there's still a lot of vegetation and accretion on the rest of the site, um, and it has it, it, it is worked well. Uh, but we have advised that uh, more stone and more riprap uh, may be need, needed to go at that um, end. Um, the, the drawing at the top shows the uh, direction that we believe vessel generated waves may wash into a tidal terrace, the tidal terraces being the green areas um, and the, the typical side that vessels will go up and down an estuary um, and those those areas therefore may need to be designed carefully uh, with less um, 90 degree angles so more gently sloping walls, um, curves and more and more riprap to counteract that. Um, I hinted earlier at steepness of float slope being important and we know that if wave energy is a, uh, a problem then the one in seven slope where you've got your considering face um, is still too steep if you've got a high amount of wave energy. One in ten is fine um, and one in four will never work, it's far too steep. And we know that the design at Battersea I think is um, possibly slightly steeper than one in seven um, so that's why we think that hasn't that hasn't um, succeeded or the sediment that was put in hasn't lasted. Uh, litter. On some of these sites you've got 
kind of uh, groin style structures across the terraces and we realised that they can trap uh, litter between the terraces. Um, some have fared quite well for litter, such as the um, left hand photograph. Some are absolutely chock a block full of litter. Um, and that is a combination of, of, of where in the estuary you are um, and also which direction um, the, the site faces. So we've discovered with the, uh, the naturalized setback that if you're clever with your creek entrance and exit direction, then you're less likely to get rubbish washed into the site via uh, wave energy. Um, timbers. This was a late addition actually to the website and we, we rehashed the uh, information at the last minute. Um, but it was the importance of having structural timbers uh, being hardwood um, and therefore lasting. The photograph on the left shows a terrace where um, softwood has been used and it's fallen out and the fill behind has therefore fallen out. Um, or, um, um, and, and you've still got vegetation in there, but, but it's, it's not to the level that it would have been intended to before. Um, so we came up with the idea of having um, habitat timbers, uh, which are the soft ones that can be uh, bolted on and can fail and, and, and fall away at a later date. We've also come up with um, ideas for how those timbers should be secured so that they last the longest using a bracket rather than having a bolt through the center. So the photograph at the bottom shows bolts that once the hole starts to rot and enlarge, the timber just falls away. So therefore it's better to completely enclose the timber with a, with a, um, a, a bracket around it. Um, so that is on there as well. Um, so we launched in July last year on a very hot and sunny day on a boat uh, with the Thames Estuary Partnership and the Port of London Authority and Steve Coldclough, um, uh, our fisheries um, consultant. Um, and we had a boat full of developers and we went up and down the tidal Thames and we spoke about the different sites and we spoke about the, uh, the results and the design principles. Um, and it went hitch free, which was great. So um, we also had a few environment agency stuff on the boat, funny enough. Um, and this is the, the website, uh, www.estryedges.co.uk. Um, it flicks between uh, two photographs, one show, showing a greener uh, image. Um, and this is where I need to give um, thanks to the project sponsors. So the Port of London Authority, as, as I've already said, they paid for the website design uh, and host the site. Um, the Environment Agency put in the largest financial contribution to the, uh, the, the first phase of this project. Um, Tideway provided a financial contribution, uh, so that's the super sewer. Uh, the Dems Estuary Partnership uh, project managed the whole uh, rewrite of the website and are continuing to project manage a legacy project to look at getting uh, further monitoring um, and more developer uh, uptake. Um, Steve Coldclough, who's from the Institute of Fisheries Management, provided free advice uh, and data well beyond his contractual ask to do the fish surveys. Uh, and Jacobs, under the remit of the Thames Estuary Asset Management Project, uh, provided the engineering surveys at the, the 17 sites. So thank you to all of those people. Um, the legacy. Uh, so last year, 2019, there was a project called the uh, Citizen Fish Project, also run by the Thames Estuary um, partnership by uh, Eve uh, Sanders and that was looking at training students uh, from a couple of universities to do surveys with the aim of building monitoring uh, into university courses. Um, those surveys are now successfully part of the UCL Aquatic Sciences Masters and other universities are now showing interest which is which is great um, and the long-term ambition is to develop an estuary focused university degree course. Um, from 2020 onwards, uh, we're hoping a better rollout and tools uh, to influence uptake by developers, uh, such as uh, animations to show uh, encroachment into an estuary and then what we hope to achieve by setting back and giving something back in terms of salt marsh. Um, improving advice on adapting features for climate change. So although we know something and there is something on the website about suggesting that terraces should be adaptable and able to be um, and have more timbers fitted in front of them so that they can retain more 
sediment as sea level rises. Um, it's fairly limited. There's no examples of that. So it's all, it's all at the moment, it's suggestions for designers to implement. Um, and also further integration of the work with academic, with academic research, maybe some published papers. So I'd like to say thank you again to Jo Heiss, my colleague, biodiversity technical specialist. She's in the bottom right hand corner. That, this was us surveying for geomorphology and litter at Wandsworth, uh, where it was a construction site at the time and a tower block was going up. Hence we're in hard hats, high vis and all of the uh, paraphernalia. So I hand over to questions. Over to you, Stuart. Yeah, so thanks, Rich. Uh, we have you're you're on mute, questions. I think. Uh, am I? Can you hear me? Oh, no, you're not now. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we have started to get some questions come through. So um, I'll fly through then. Um, we've got uh, just under 15 minutes, so we should be able to get through uh, quite a few. So uh, first question, Rich. What is the typical design life of the structures in the case studies that you showed? Uh, who is responsible for the maintenance of the case studies as well? Okay. So the developer is typically responsible for the maintenance or the whoever the developer hands the land management over to. Um, and we've stressed on the Estuary Edges Estu website to uh, continue to maintain and look for softwood and replace softwood. Um, hardwood may last the length of the development. We've asked for the um, designs to be strong, strong enough, stable enough, that sounds a bit familiar, um, to last the length of the lifetime of the development. Um, it may not be possible with some of the timber based ones, but certainly with a concrete um, terrace, with, with, a, with a sheet steel pile and a concrete uh, design, uh, then it will be possible. Um, the naturalized setback won't need any maintenance. Uh, it is it is the maintenance free option. You put your brushwood down, you rebuild your clay bund at the back, and there isn't much that needs doing. It should um, it should succeed with vegetation, and then with sea level rise, you will get um, if if you've left enough space, you will lose some of that planting at the front to increasing the large area of mud flats. Um, it may be necessary for that bund at the back to be raised, but uh, we've also suggested that the bund, the design should include space for the bund to be raised further back rather than further forwards, because uh, typically you'd need a larger footprint for, for a new, for a higher embankment, for a taller embankment. Um, so like the lifespan is assessed as part of the engineering survey. So that is available on the website uh, as data. So you can look at the designs. So we've learned a lot from the existing designs, but the advice is that the design should last the length of the lifespan of the development. Okay, thanks Rich. So the next question uh, regarding the litter, uh, you showed a picture uh, where there's lots of plastic. Um, site design uh, with trap litter in place is also to be considered a positive outcome, uh, so are you removing it from the main river downstream to the sea? Yes, and actually we've, we realised that when we were writing the website, um, we thought actually we could filter plastics and rubbish using some of these sites. So although we have no case studies of it, we've hinted on the website to have a sacrificial end, maybe the end where the wave energy is focused. Um, where, where I was speaking about uh, vessel wash and maybe having to have more uh, riprap, that end could be designed to have a gate and steps and the developer could go in to actually remove the rubbish at the litter at that specific end of the terrace. It's never been done um, because obviously you're, you're, you're losing the biodiversity value if you're going to lay it with grass crete um, or come up with a, with a pen where the, where the litter would go. Uh, it might not be vegetated but the option would be there and certainly as the permitting reg regulatory authority who receives those designs we'd be really willing to work with uh, a consultant to, to, to help that design actually happen. Next question uh, regarding encroachment. Are there circumstances where encroachment can help constrain location so where the geomorphic, uh, geomorphic drivers are counter to what you're trying to achieve develop the conditions uh, for increased deposition? for example, by reducing current flows at the edges? Yes, possibly. So groins 
would could help in some places to reduce currents um, and allow finer sediment deposition uh, but and the groins however would take up the minimum of footprint so i, I don't see groins as a, as a problem um, we have we uh, uh, as a regulatory body we have a yes if approach for navigation so um, helping navigation so when a new pontoon or a jetty comes in uh, we, we typically uh, allow it even if it covers up um, or, or loses intertidal areas but for any other use we, we generally say no or we ask the local authority to say no because the is the planning authority that has the has the final say and that probably leads on to the next question i think um from my point of view i'm not everyone on the call I'm, I, I work in flood risk um and encroachment would be a big concern for me um for flood risk and and especially if there wasn't um uh, mitigation for any encroachment in, into the uh, into the river so um has the estuary edges project had any effect on flood risk is there positive effect to the work we're doing on flood risk what a good question um there is the potential that some of the setbacks there is there is a potential that the through through a mon monetary value the amount of concrete or sheet steel poles that needs to be put in at the back could be intercepted by some of the uh, reed bed energy however we don't have any evidence to date to show that so i would open the the question to the academic community and further research to, to um, answer that question it has been answered to a degree by larissa naylor um, in the integrated grey green infrastructure project so i refer you to that and that is referenced on the sgg's website so where our case studies overlap there are links to the IGGI work. Um, uh, Lydia Burgess Gamble at the Environment Agency has also headed up the Working with Natural Processes work that does look at that form of quantification as well. But I would suggest it's still uh, an area of investigation and that we still don't know enough about it really. So uh, sadly not, I can't say that our estuary edge designs do that for definite. Okay. Um, I've just got a message saying that Jane would like to answer or, or give response to one of the questions that was asked. So, uh, mm. Jane, I don't know how um, yeah, you're off the... <laughs> no, I was just um, trying to um, make it where the answer questions were answered live so that way they would um, come out of the list and then people, you could see the new ones pop to the top. So, I don't have anything to actually add as an answer. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. Oh, that's okay. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, there's two further questions. Um, on the success of the upstream scheme along the River Otter towards reintroduce, reintroduction of beavers to enhance their environment and natural flood, manage, uh, natural flood risk management, are there any ideal estuarine species of flora or fauna which could be reintroduced to the terraces, i.e. ideal species of grasses to fix the sediment? Um, I don't know if that's your field, Rich, or if it, that would be within the guidance. Uh, so we hoped eventually to have um, a matrix of uh, salinity and energy which would put different plant species within uh, the estuary in that matrix but we never achieved it on the website it is, is a nice to have that we still want to do um, however that does go against the principle that natural succession should be the first the first principle so um, having made sure that your geomorphology is correct and that sediment will accrete the plants and the fish and the invertebrates should then come along on their own accord um, but yes there is guidance on the website for some species of plants um, it's got a massive caveat underneath saying we advise don't do this planting but if you're a developer and you want to make it look nice straight away then you could consider these plants and this is not a um, an exhaustive list there are more uh, available um, because we found in some places where it's been planted that they're not the right plants they, they're not the right ones for the uh, available energy and they've died off um, or they've spread massively um, so if you if you look on the website and you look under the um, the wildlife planting in green space section there are species listed under there We've got two more questions and then um, I think we'll wrap it up there. So we've, we've got just under five minutes here, Rich. Um, 
what is your experience after how many years can you decide whether a project was successful or not? Oh, that's a good question. Um, estuaries are dynamic anyway, and we also know that there's changing sea levels, uh, maybe changes in use. So even though a site might be successful within the first couple of years, so I would say that you can probably tell within the first couple of years because you've got to have a couple of growing seasons um, for plants to start establishing. It's probably more difficult to tell if it's been planted, um, but I would give it a couple of years for sites to establish and we, we do actually have a, a monitoring regime set out within the first five years, within the first 10 years, and then 10 years and beyond on the monitoring and maintenance section. So it, it, there is guidelines for what a developer uh, or a consultant should do and how you should monitor it. So that's all in there. Um, if, if actually, that, that probably answers the question more easily. Go and have a look at the monitoring and maintenance section. Um, so because we have that experience, but I think you could probably assess it within the first couple of years preliminarily, but we can't say that there might not be a change in the environment, a new jetty, um, a, a new tower block gets built that shades the terrace, because we can't really object to that, um, where it might deteriorate again. And that there has been examples of that happening, sadly. Okay, and then the final question, what is the scope for over the wall drainage or suds for waterfront development? Lots, I think. Uh, over the wall, so not through the wall, is that, can they clarify that question? So that was from Matt Jackson, I don't know if we can take, is it possible to get people off mute, Barbara Jane? Is Matt able to take himself off mute? Yeah, we could probably do that. Um, we just need, um, we just need Barbara to find his name in the list of attendees. So I think you said over the wall drainage. Yeah, or suds. Okay. Or just I, so if you if you're saying what's the potential to have outfalls through through a wall, then yes, with there's out that's outfalls happen all the time, and we're fine with that. The the focus is to have your sustainable urban drainage inland of your flood of your tidal flood defence to join in through an outfall, which you then focus a estuary edge terrace on um, because that 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 drainage through that terrace is is the most replicable of the natural environment um, if, if i interpret that question as can you put a pipe up and over the top of a concrete wall rather than punching it through we generally don't like a pipe being put over the top but that would probably go more to someone like stuart who used to work in that team that permitted stuff like that we managed to get mouth mute does that answer your question matt Okay. I don't think we've gotten him off, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah, I think um, <laughs> well, touch, me. Yeah, well, touch, touch, I, I know. Um, I mean, we, we always look at things on a case by case basis, but over the wall um, outfalls aren't, aren't something we particularly uh, like. I, I, I'm not an engineer. I don't know the, the technologies and why we don't like them, but it is something that I um, would, would seek guidance on. And, and often, you know, in the past, I, I have a objected or recommended objections based on over the wall drainage. So, um, yeah, I don't, I can't answer it too much further, I'm afraid. So that is all the questions. Um, within the, the chat here, um, we have put a link um, to the website, so please go and have a look. Um, we've also put a link um, to the survey. Um, so uh, there's a, a survey to talk um, for you to feedback how this um, webinar went. And um, yeah, just to look at the Siren website for future events. And um, lots of stuff going on at a second. Um, everything has been converted to uh, online webinars, so there's, there's lots to choose from. Um, and yeah, I, I just uh, to thank you for joining us and a thank you to Rich once again for uh, giving us now his time uh, to give this presentation. Thank you, Rich. My pleasure, spread the word, spread the word. And I'm gonna hand back to Barbara somehow. Thank you everyone.